So um, whether we call it AI or ML, we know very well that this has been a part of cybersecurity for years. Um, today, looking forward to digging into what that intersection means. Before we do, though, I wanted to do a brief plug for some work that came out of our Aspen US and global cybersecurity groups just last month. Um, we published a report on what organizations um, are doing right now and what they should be doing as some of these AI tools develop and come into an operational context. To do this, we started by envisioning two futures, one where attackers had the advantage and one where defenders had the advantage and kind of back backwards mapped our recommendations from there. Um, I won't say too much about it now, uh, just kind of provide that teaser and encourage you to head to aspendigital.org to learn more. Um, so without further ado, let's go ahead and turn to our panelists. Um, I would like to start by asking each of you a question. Um, what is one misconception or maybe a headline that isn't quite right all the time about the intersection of AI and cybersecurity. Jonas, let's start with you. Sure, so uh, people are sometimes thinking that we are in the era where AI will find completely new zero days. And basically we have agents that exploit them on their own and basically go rogue and buy bitcoins and uh, extort people. And although this is technically possible, this is far from where we currently are. Excellent. Paul, how about you? Um, we learn <clears throat> the wrong things too often by Hollywood movies. Uh, right? Real spy craft doesn't look anything like a James Bond movie. Uh, so it is with this. Um, AI uh, is present. Um, it's been present in every era. It just means something different depending on what the current technology uh, really means. And uh, all it really is is augmentation uh, at the moment. Uh, it's not, uh, there's, there's no creativity to it. And so the things that we have to worry about are perhaps who will deploy it uh, soonest, and there we get into the asymmetric uh, incentive model and so forth, but uh, most of what we get wrong is by thinking that AI is gonna be like it is in the movies. We're decades away from that. So, Paul, really quick follow-up. Is there a movie that gets it right that you can think of off the top of your head? I can come back at the end on that one. If o you only me. if I had bodyguards for the people whose movie I did not pick. Uh, so, uh, no. <laughs> no, essentially no. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Jason, over to you. So, Katie, my goal is to get the first red card today for insulting other panelists. So I'm gonna pick on Paul and Heather, and they have created a conundrum for us in detection in cybersecurity using AI. So in my opinion, the mindset shift we need is we need to measure how inaccurate our AI models are when we use detection. But the conundrum is, Paul has created such accurate models that are free at AWS, and I applaud you for that, for looking at instance vulnerabilities and code vulnerabilities that my security team is used to 100% accuracy when they use AWS. And at Google, when was the last time you saw Heather and her organization misspell a word or have a grammatical error in the AI that they're using to suggest auto responses? When was the last time you had a false positive security alert from Heather's team and Google? And so these two have done amazing work, but they set us up for failure for the mere mortals like me who lead detection teams. And so I encourage all of us to tell our teams when you measure success of using AI and detection looking for attacks, you need to measure how many false positives you have, not how many 100% accurate instances you have. Because if our AI tools are tuned that all of us in this room have zero false positives for detection, then we aren't looking hard enough for those 500 new instances of ran ransomware or the infinitely more sophisticated APT attacks. So Paul and Heather, no thanks to you for making our job harder. All right. Well, I love you, um, I love you Jason. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll put a pin on that one for just this moment and continue the question about um, any common misconceptions you see about this topic. Yeah, I kind of want to follow on um, to what the other panelists said. I think, you know, 
we've been living with AI for a very long time. Um, and I think there's a, a misconception that because generative AI has really come to the forefront in the last year or so, uh, that suddenly everything has changed. Um, what I think we don't realize is that we have all the strategies we need to secure AI. We've been looking at software supply chains, for example, for a really long time. We've been talking about building coalitions and open protocols and open frameworks for a long time. Um, the internet was built as an open environment. We have all these strategies. Yes, we need to apply it in kind of a new way for this new kind of thing. And to your point, Jason, um, automation, we've also been automating in SOX for like over a decade. We now have a new tool. We've been dealing with false positives. I'm actually quite an optimist, we'll get to that. Um, but I think we have all these strategies. We just need to learn as teams and as societies how to adapt what we already know. Excellent, I think we'll hit on that uh, adaption point in just a moment. Uh, Kus, over to you. Yeah, I, th I think like Heather, I'm also an optimist. Um, and uh, I'll keep it, uh, my misconception, a little bit uh, closer to, um, to the news and closer to corporate environments. Um, we've heard in the last uh, two days a lot about uh, examples of adversarial attacks against companies, a lot of fear. For example, last week uh, we were talking about the CFOs that were all in a panic because of the Hong Kong deep fake. Um, and I think the big misconception is that we don't know how to handle that kind of threat. The, um, the deep fake threats against, for example, finance departments are an evolution of what we've seen in uh, business email compromise, for example. And we know how to handle that. And that is doubling down on existing financial controls. All right, excellent. Well, Heather, I'd love to go to you first, um, in part because I think this question may be a bit of a response to what Jason shared. Um, you've called yourself before a defender optimist. Um, when it comes to AI and cybersecurity, um, how, do you, how do you see this optimism playing out? And what is Google doing to increase that optimism? Yeah, well, I've, I've not been so optimistic about my field in the 25 years I've been doing it than I am today. Um, we often talk about how, as defenders, we have to be kind of perfect all the time make sure you're always patched, got the right configs, et cetera. And that it only takes you know, one bad guy with a vulnerability scan to sort of get in. We call this roughly the defender's dilemma. Um, and the reality is that security is a data problem. In order to see everything and enough things to find that one hold, you need a lot of data. And we've been, um, as an industry, talking about logs aggregation and automation for a long time, but haven't had the right tools um, to actually process that data, look at that data for anomalies, and to be able to see things in near real time to get to them fast enough to shut down major attacks. Large language models understand logs, and in fact, understand we can teach them to understand false positives as well. And we can teach them to look at aggregated data over many, many years of time, and this gives us a leg up. And so I'm actually an optimist because I feel like for the first time, whether you're you know, configuring a system or creating an access group to determine whether or not somebody should access something or looking at something after the fact through logs, the very first time in our field we have actually a chance to do that and do that in real time and, and defend. So I'm an optimist for that reason. Excellent. And then. I guess to, to follow up on the theme that Jason mentioned, for some of those enterprises that maybe are a little bit less mature in their processes, um, their training, et cetera, how do you see uh, this tide kind of lifting all boats in the future? I think what you're gonna see the security industry and in fact um, some of the large platforms like AWS, Google, um, and actually we'll, through open source and open frameworks, some of the smaller platforms as well, be able to just provide this service by default. So, um, you know, if you are in a business that has nothing to do with AI, but you have, say, um, a platform that you buy to provide the security service or even to provide your communications platform, you're gonna have all these features built in by default. And this is what we mean by secure by design, secure by default, is you shouldn't have to go and buy the seat belts and the airbags um, using uh, the earlier analogy of, of the car. Um, this is the, uh, you know, the life system of, of the car is all of the safety features and that will in include all of this technology by default. And it will take some time to get there, but that's the vision. 
Excellent. Thanks, Heather. Um, Paul, I'd love to bring you into the conversation um, and have kind of a future-facing uh, question uh, for both the short and the long term. And you can answer in the same way for both or separately. Uh, who do you think AI will advantage more, attackers or defenders? Um, I think in the short term, there is no answer to that. In the long term, it's going to return to normal. Uh, and I am a security, I'm a defender pessimist uh, due to certain inevitabilities that have always been with us and I think will always be with us. Um, so the, since those dictate my answer, I'll explain what they are. Uh, the attacker, when they win, they know what they've won. Uh, the defender, when we win, uh, we don't know what we would have lost. And so that is a powerful difference in incentives and how you can argue for the resources that it takes to keep the enterprise uh, safe and secure. I don't think that's going to change, right? It's a profit center for the attacker. It is a cost center for the defender. Another inevitability is, uh, has to do with complexity. Complexity in information systems has the role of entropy in physical systems. Uh, it always increases. And, you know, when we deploy new defensive technology, we are adding to the burden of that which we must ourselves understand, patch, monitor, and so on. Otherwise, we may have created an even worse problem than the one we came to solve. A lot of companies are, uh, might be resourced to add more defensive technology, but not resourced to add the staff expertise that it takes to properly understand all of that. Um, and as long as complexity keeps increasing and humans keep being human, uh, it's going to trend toward uh, the bad guys winning uh, long term. Now, it doesn't mean the world will end, uh, but there will be some business failures that are due to norms changing out from under us. I agree that uh, we have existing financial controls that would have solved the deep fake problem. But I must point out that we don't use them. Our norm is to not use them. Our norm is to trust a voice on the phone as being the boss or a member of your family or President Biden. Um, and that norm has to change. And that means it will have to change well outside of this room, right? We are the ones uh, that are here that understand these issues and can recognize when a norm is no longer serving us uh, there's a big world out there that will take a long time to adapt to this. And during that time, bad guys are going to win pretty often. Paul, that's a great segue to my next question. Would love to get a little bit more tactical and uh, come over to Coos. Um, how are organizations using AI now? And from a security standpoint, um, what do you um, or others that you interact with think about when installing a new AI or ML tool? Yeah, great question. Um, there's uh, there's an increasing use of AI in in the enterprise uh, in various different ways, from very simple things like um, uh, the tools that uh, that were that are being used for translation. Uh, summarization is a very popular use case right now for generative uh, uh, AI. Um, so we see a lot of that uh, being deployed right now. Um, code generation is, uh, is an up-and-comer um, that's uh, very popular with uh, software developers. Um, I think when, when we think about introducing new capabilities, there's of course the sort of the, the AI security framework, right, that all of you are familiar with, which is about protecting the data, uh, protecting the models themselves, attacks against the models, uh, detecting adversarial use, that's all the sort of the, the cybersecurity technology um, angles that, uh, that you are all familiar with. Um, what I would like to highlight is um, the, um, the, the concern about not introducing new risk when you're introducing AI or machine learning into the corporation. And, um, I, maybe I, I'm taking a little bit of a different angle than um, than you would expect, and that is um, that um, I'm very much in favor of principles of transparency and trust. And so that is um, we 
we keep emphasizing in, in our company um, that the human remains at the center, not the machine. Um, that um, employees are part of the introduction, that they understand what's going on, what we're deploying. That, uh, and, and when we introduce new use cases, that our employees understand which use cases are acceptable and which are not. Uh, and you can, you can think of examples, uh, uh, plenty of um, um, the use of uh, pl public AI models um, and employees uh, submitting all sorts of uh, sensitive corporate data to those, um, to those models. So that's one of the, um, one of the use cases that, uh, that we need to train employees about. One of the things that we did over the last summer uh, at IBM was we spent a week with the entire company uh, exposing everybody to AI tools um, at different levels where employees who are very technical could play with very advanced uh, capabilities around um, uh, model training, um, uh, running automations, uh, but even the, the non-technical people um, were given the tools to play with how do you configure a summarization tool? How do you use that to, um, to summarize, quickly summarize contracts, um, uh, process uh, other corporate documents? And, and I think that's one of the areas that is, that I think requires a lot more attention, is familiarizing your staff with AI. Absolutely, I think especially for those that don't live and breathe uh, this content day to day, there's definitely a lot of learning and education uh, to happen for all of us to be successful. Um, Jonas, I would love to go over to you um, first to explain a bit more about your organization, and then um, you know you're building these tools. So, what advice would you have for organizations that are bringing AI functions online? So, I, I agree with a lot that has been said in terms of that complexity of large organizations is extremely. Uh, difficult to bring together with the speed of change that we see. This is probably the fastest speed of technological change that we've ever seen. And so the ability to adapt and use new methods and adapt like on a personal level, adapt to new uh, paradigms like images may not be real, voices may not be real, the ability to ap adapt organizational processes and uh, workforce allocation. This is all like, especially like we're doing a lot in Germany. Um, there's huge enterprises here that have extremely valuable data and deep know-how. But transforming these enterprises into a new generation, that is basically the, the the version of that manufacturing, automotive, whatever industry in after the next industrial revolution is difficult. Um, and and this is something where I fear that. A lot of the safeguards, a lot of the, the complacency we build, a lot of the processes we build also for checks and balances, a lot of the slowness we have in our political system, all this is now coming to bite us. Um, so what, what we're doing, if, I, if I'm in, in, in the mood for bragging, I'll, I can say well, we're like the first gener generative AI company, uh, in, in, or like one of the first, we started in 2019, I left Apple, um, and we, build, we started building large language models before GPT-3 was out. And since then, the paradigm of what actually could be a business model here, I think is changing every quarter, something like that. Um, so that's exciting. And one of the things that, that we are specializing on is like we're not that interested in building tech that can, can write a poem to your mother's birthday or something like that. But so nice. And that, that's phenomenal. And I recommend you all use that for your next mother's birthday. Um, but it's not really Proof what we're... it first. Yeah, exactly, right? But it's not really what we're interested in. We're interested in solving these really complex and critical use cases where you don't even have a, a, a one right answer. In if you go to like requirements engineering and manufacturing, if you write quarterly reports, if you're in like government or security, we're working with like law enforcement and defense. And in all those use cases, you have to have the human in a role of responsibility. The human cannot just say, I ask the chatbot and the chatbot is mostly right. So this is the move I'm making. And uh, so one of the things that we invented is a level of explainability where you can, for every factual claim that the generative AI is putting out, you can see why it is putting out that. So this is not necessarily mean that we have less uh, hallucinations or less errors, but we can give the human, a at a quick glance, the, the ability to, to check that. 
Excellent. We'll return to that uh, human in the loop question momentarily. Um, but Jason, would love to come over to you. I think um, a lot of the AI conversation presumes that you know a tool or a service that you might access is just in the cloud. Um, but what about the intersection of AI and hardware? Is, is this a thing? And how should we think about it? Sure. Uh, and, and I like being on this panel with the diversity of AI companies and cloud companies and service companies. So. Um, as, as a representative of the hardware industry, there is a trend to build AI on a chip. And one thing that I've learned is the diversity of our customers, and they each have unique preferences as to whether they want to share with large cloud providers or not. Um, so one challenge that we've been, uh, uh, that, that uh, infrastructure customers have asked us is how do you defend using AI tools against attackers that are using cloud infrastructure and these powerful capabilities, but my infrastructure, critical infrastructure devices are not allowed to use those capabilities. So it's not a Lenovo specific solution, it's industry wide, there's Qualcomm, all the, uh, Nvidia, these different vendors, where we can take an AI model and put it on a chip. Now it's certainly not as powerful and as flexible and dynamic as what you could get with one of the hyperscalers, um, but it does allow some capability. And it also is a solution, Kuz mentioned this, that there are some customers that don't want their data going outside the device. And also that is a solution. Certainly because it's on a chip, it's more narrow in scope, um, it, it can't perform a, as wide variety of a function, but there is a solution that's happening in the hardware industry that'll give the, our, our spectrum of customers yet another way to use AI to defend themselves and put, uh, potentially protect their privacy, should they choose. Thanks, Jason. Um, so I would love to throw this one out to the group and I'll kind of see who, who uh, dives into it first. Uh, returning to that human oversight question. Um, so if we assume that these AI tools will be making security decisions or are currently making any variety of security decisions for our organizations, how far should it go? What decisions are okay to automate fully and what really still requires that human inf intervention? So I'd like to jump in here because I think it dovetails nicely to what Jason was saying. I mean, I think um, we're going to see some differentiation in how AI is used. There's not one use of AI that's going to fit every situation. We're going to see AI in the hyperscalers, much the way that we've seen automation in data warehousing for a long time. Um, you're going to see AI embedded into your communications platforms. Um, you know, whether that's a you know a Google Workspace, Microsoft. Um, uh, a suite of uh, software as well, but you're also going to see it on devices, right? So, um, so Google, we have Gemini, we've got Gemini, Gemini now on the phones. That's a small model on the phone because users want to be in the loop. For example, right? We're going to see AI in um, in socks where we're going to want humans in the loop to make decisions about whether or not you're actually being attacked. So, I, I think this principle will underlie every use of AI, I don't think that we're going to want explicitly, at least not for the near term, and I would say probably half a decade uh, until we really understand what we're doing. Um, we're not going to want fully automated. But today, you know, many of you are probably using a search engine online. Um, there's autocomplete, right? That autocomplete's got an AI model behind it. Right? And you're probably letting it make some decisions sometimes because it's the right thing, and you're probably augmenting it sometimes because it's the wrong thing. Um, and that probably, you know, in a year, that will be more experiences. In a decade, that will be a lot of experiences, but we will still want to give humans a choice about whether to proceed. Thanks, Heather. Any other reactions to this human oversight question? I'd, I'd love to, yes. Um, yeah, uh, to uh, to continue on on some of the points that Hedo was making, um, I think there's there's a lot of potential in security operations for artificial intelligence. On the other hand, it's a lot of it, it's just a new paradigm of automation, and we've done automation in security operations forever. Uh, that's the whole point of doing um, security operations at scale. Um, the, what we've been doing for a long time with uh, uh, machine learning, for example, uh, I think 
with, um, with sort of the generative models, we can now look at more dimensions in the data than we've been able to traditionally with machine learning, where you could build a model to look at, for example, net flow behavior, other behavior, and now with the more powerful models, you can look across multiple dimensions, like process information, file system activity, network activity, and look at the larger patterns. So automation is, is something that, uh, that we already do, that this is gonna help. I think where I see already um, interesting uh, opportunities is in uh, threat hunting, where we're building models that really understands what is normal in a large environment across multiple dimensions, and then the ability to formulate a threat hunting hypothesis. What if we miss something other t uh, in our detection? What would that look like if attacker APT, give me a number, um, was in our environment? What are, the, what are the techniques? How would we, if we missed it in the detection, how could, what would be some of the breadcrumbs that we would be looking for? Um, and there's already some promise with, um, with uh, large models to say, okay, give me a couple of candidates of things that our humans are then going to further explore. And, and that's a, a massive acceleration of, uh, of their activity. And there are many different use cases in, uh, in security operations like that. Thanks, cool. Goose. All right, let's go to uh, Jonas and then to Paul. Sure, thanks. Um, so I believe it doesn't matter how good AI will ever get, responsibility will always be with humans that put AI into action. We already have cases where AI, like they are fully automated processes with dire legal consequences. We have automated traffic lights, like smart traffic lights. And this has direct legal consequences. Could ruin your life if you're on a red light. So we are already there to some extent, but we cannot never shift responsibility to the system. And for many of our customers, the, the choice is not put we put humans on that or AI. The choice often is put we put AI on it or nobody at all because there's such a worker shortage. So I think that we just have to weigh all the, look at our risk surface, weigh all the options and then take a responsible decision. And if we can, and of course AI will screw up as do humans. So the field is moving so quickly that I am uh, feeling the challenge of future proofing an answer to this question. Um, but I do agree substantially that uh, some human will remain responsible in the sense of uh, if, some, if um, Jeff decides to sue, then it'll be a person who receives the law lawsuit, not some AI agent. But um, the, God, what was I trying to say? It's hard to think of something that persists we, for many years. We uh, should be using automation wherever it is safe. And the problem with AI is that we don't yet know what is the confidence interval to put around it. Um, so uh, I predict there will be some overestimation and uh, what was just said, we're gonna see AI deployed by people who have no choice and no human to supervise it, but this is the only choice they can really make and it will be effectively making decisions. Um, and yeah, that's one of the risk factors that this audience should consider, especially if it has to do with processing job applications, for example. Do you want automated bias in the system of uh, who was rejected automatically early? Um, that's something for society to, con to consider. But in a SOC context, um, I believe its earliest use will be for things that are compatible with data processing in general. Right? What I was told when I entered this field uh, was think of the computer as an idiot with a great memory. Okay, so I don't think that's changed. We should still think of them that way, um, except they have an even better memory and uh, content addressable memory and terabytes of memory, and, and, and so, so the magnitude has changed, but our expectations should not. So to the extent that we can get uh, more alerts that are no worse than before, or better alerts by having better triage, so that humans are looking at fewer things of higher value, those are slam dunks. 
because you can audit them, you can have secondary processes which will say, yeah, we, we missed that one. We want, might want to put a stop list around that particular thing and let it through no matter what the idiot with a very smart memory uh, decided at the moment. Uh, but yeah, for anomaly detection, alerting, and triage, we already know uh, how to put guardrails around automation. So that's where I think it's going to occur first. Excellent. I really appreciated that you brought up some of those themes, themes from earlier around future-proofing that tension between security and growth. Um, in the time we have, I would love to pivot um, over to Jason and talk through maybe some of the supply chain risk components here, and in particular for some of the smaller players in the ecosystem. Jason, over to you. Sure. I think uh, when we think about AI, a model is only effective if it has a large amount of accurate data. And the more, and especially if you talk about socks and things like that, the more specific uh, it, it can be to your organization, the more accurate it can be, more timely. The challenge with that is if you're taking all that useful data and putting it, uh, sharing it with a vendor or a service where it is not secure, what protects you can also infect you. And Heather taught me that very well years ago when she was my boss. Um, I was so excited about some of these security tools, and she pointed out, if you put all this data into these tools, it can actually be more of a liability than an asset. So I think when we think about supply chain and AI, um, be sure to use vendors that you trust with your data. Um, consider using zero trust with AI. And then from the physical standpoint, first, Paul, if you want a computer with more memory, I'd be happy to sell you one. Uh, and that's true for anyone in the audience. But something uh, Lenovo uh, spends a lot of time on, as do others in the hardware industry, is how do we ensure that supply chain root of trust from the time when subcomponents are manufactured to the point that it gets to you and you can use it in your environment. All right, and definitely I think this ecosystem-wide concern is a big point. Any other reactions on the supply chain front? Yeah, I might just jump in here. Um, you know. The panel's about AI, which is great, um, but I think we also need to look at some of the other conversations happening in the field at the moment. Um, Secretary Mayorkas talked today a little bit about secure by design, safe by default. Um, the supply chain will only be something we can secure if we lean into that principle, because every aspect of gathering data, cleaning data, building software, the hardware, et cetera, all has to be kind of rethought in some ways with secure design in mind. And that includes the environment that the developer is working in and whether or not they use two-factor on their account, et cetera. So there's a, there's a, everything we are doing in the industry to secure the environment is absolutely necessary in order to secure AI. So I just want uh, us to keep that in mind that this is not a, um, a set of things that we have to do that's independent of everything else. Uh, we must lean in 100% everywhere. Excellent. Thanks, Heather. Let's go over to Koos and then over to Jonas. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And this is not, supply chain security is not an AI. There's, there are some new aspects when you bring AI in, but fundamentally this goes back to the same security principles that, we've, that, we're, that we continue to promote, secure by design. Um, and think of uh, the example about uh, sending data to, um, to suppliers of AI. It's nothing new compared to, let's say, sensitive, um, sharing sensitive litigation information with your outside counsel. And how many law firms have been seen uh, victimized by ransomware and that sort of thing, or the marketing companies that have, um, that have your customer data. Um, so I think it's, uh, it, it, those are good points, but the underlying principles remain the same. We, we want to hack Paul before he, he sues us, right? Yes. <laughs> what I really like the, the kind of idea that this is kind of like a balance between exposing ourselves and, and just kind of sharing and working together. And we're seeing the same thing, not only for security, but also for value creation. Like AI has now opened up a new continent we can conquer on like value, value creation, value capture. And of course, everybody wants to own that. Like big tech wants to own it. The, the industry players want to own that. Unless I'm startup want to own that. And so that we, we also have customers that are basically telling us that if like, and they're running our, our stuff air-gapped, kind of air-gapped on-prem and tell us, if any of your components tries to phone home, you're in deep trouble. 
And so it's basically the, the same kind of applies for value. And I think we, we're all trying to capture value and, and build something that's valuable, and that, but that's also like sustainable. Excellent. So would love to um, dive into one more category before we open it up to a few audience questions in our final few minutes. Um, for the panel, uh, kind of a workforce question here, but specifically around security teams and upskilling. Do you worry that if AI takes over some of the more basic security functions, it could become harder uh, to train new staff because they, the AI is doing some of those more um, kind of basic operations that are entry points into the field? I have strong opinions, so I'll go first. <laughs> yeah. um, I hear this refrain a lot that we're going to automate away security jobs, a few points. We have a lot of open, unfilled positions in the field. We're not going to run out of work for people to do for a very, very long time. Secondly, um, what I hear most from people graduating from undergraduate degrees or certification programs is that it's really hard for them to get their first job in security because they have no experience. And I actually think that um, we, we just did this uh, amazing experiment inside Google. We, we created an incident gym. It's, it's a chatbot that will teach you how to respond to an incident. So I actually think some of these tools, if we get it right, will give people real world, well, not real world, but real enough world experience that people will feel confident hiring them as early career talent. And I think that will help us with this pipeline problem we have in the jump between the education and, and the job. Um, and thirdly, once you've been in the job for four or five years, all of these tasks are no longer interesting and people burn out and they leave the field. I want to get rid of these tasks because nobody likes them. And I want to leave behind the hard work that we really need humans to do that is interesting, exciting, uh, and gets people thinking in innovative ways. Yeah, and frankly, as a CISO, uh, you know, these, these simple tasks need to be automated because it's just frankly, dumb work, and um, it's boring work, it's repetitive work, it's not interesting after a couple of years, but it's not even interesting to enter in the field. It's much more interesting to, um, to have the tasks automated because the response will be faster, it might be done a lot better, um, and if we have people go to college and get a degree in cybersecurity, frankly, to have them do endless jobs in the SOC that is a lot of it is manual work and, and, and stitching systems together just by, you know, with multiple screens. It's not interesting. That work should go away. Any other reactions, Paul? Yeah, so the things that we don't yet know how they work are hard to automate. And consciousness would be an example. Uh, creativity, high judgment, other examples. Uh, that is what the security industry prizes among our workforce. Um, and I'm not expecting any competition from the machines on those three uh, metrics, uh, maybe not within my career, but certainly not soon enough that it would matter as a policy issue. Um, but the question is, does do these trends mean that our own entry-level jobs, which is how these uh, college grads are currently getting into the field. They're starting as interns, they're starting as, as low-level techs. Uh, when we raise the low level and we say, yeah, all of that, that was undifferentiated heavy lifting, we don't use humans for that anymore, does that mean we're pulling the ladder up and saying there isn't a way to get in here anymore? I don't think so. The job market uh, and the employee pool are seeking each other and they will adapt. I had a similar conversation with one of the biggest legal teams out there, and they basically thought about, like, if we have all these tools now, what are, like, junior lawyers going to do? And they remember spending years basically going through files and, like, reading, endless reading, tens of thousands of documents. Um, and then basically at the end of the conversation, they thought that, yeah, may maybe we are losing like a little bit of experience the way that the new generation cannot read physical maps anymore, right? But we're gaining so much from that because they remembered th those almost as wasted years. And the learning actually was a very minimal. So we can kind of compress learning, we can better direct learning, but this is a, a challenge for the organizations to transform. 
And I have no doubt that kind of these organizations as like tech organizations are leading the charge, but we also have basically to bring like the non-tech organizations along for the ride. And then I just say Microsoft Excel did not eliminating, eliminate accounting jobs, and I don't think AI will eliminate cyber jobs. All right, assuring. So uh, in the last few minutes here, we'd love to open it up to one or two audience questions. Would invite you to raise your hand, share your question, and who it's for. We'll start. Thank you. Um, my question is, what uh, changes, what changes, if any, will end-user organizations need to make to cybersecurity governance in the light of um, increasing amount of AI being deployed in cybersecurity? What changes might, and I'm thinking about, you know, water company, manufacturing company, university, and so on, rather than a tech company. Is that for the panel or anyone? Yeah, anyone who wishes right. to offer an opinion. I think the first thing you have to think about is your own data, and then secondly, your people, maybe the other way around. I mean, I think you have to upskill basic AI understanding in how job functions will change, whether it's in the legal function, um, in finance, et cetera. We all have to go back to school. The, the good news is there's so much online training now in this space, most of it free. Um, I think MIT, actually, in the United States just released a course. So, you know, the continuous learning of every profession that is knowledge-based at this point is, you know, number one. Number two, think about data governance. It's not necessarily AI governance as much as it is data governance. Know where you want to use AI, and if you're going to use a third party who has your data, even if you're not using them for AI, just keep in mind, everybody's putting AI in everything. So you need to, for example, in your contracts, with your third parties stipulate how do you want your data to be used, regardless of whether or not they're an AI first company because they will be at some point. So that's an example of that. Um, but then of course, if you're using any technology, um, just start to equate data, AI, and tech together in terms of how you think about your overall governance. That's what I would say. So that's what those lawyers are up to from uh, Jeff's talk. Well, I was thinking, Jeff, that um, if we have all these lawyers freed up, you'll have lots of lawyers who can support your initiative. <laughs> Excellent. And um, can I mention one thing? It's a little broader than cyber because it doesn't apply specifically to some of our SOC functions, but diversity is extremely important to understand the bias that AI, because it's historical looking, can introduce in your output. So your AI output may say a doctor is a male, and that is wrong, and you need to be aware of the bias that AI models can introduce using historic data, whether you're in cyber or any other use of AI. Absolutely, great addition there. I think there was a question over here. All right, we'll wait for the mic. Thank you, Peter Brown, European Parliament. Um, back in a simpler information age, 1983, a junior Soviet official probably averted nuclear war by refusing to accept the data which was presented to him on an incoming, supposed incoming nuclear attack and refused to send it up the line of command. Given we are now having massively exponential growth of data, how can we realistically keep the human in the loop and give them meaningful responsibility? And how do you, what do you do to mediate between the human having to make a decision and that massively exponential um, data that they're presented with? Maybe Paul or something. So, so that's why you need the false positives. Um, because if you rely on AI tools and take their answer as a given, then the humans don't understand the logic and go through the logs to figure out how that decision was made. So why false positives are so valuable is because it allows that human to review what decisions the AI tool is making, what data it's ingesting, and how it's coming up with that decision. The other thing, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Paul. I've spoken a lot. Um, so at, at scale, all right, take whatever is your, the current number of a thing that you do and multiply by six million, find an answer that will work for that in case it, it comes to pass. Uh, at scale, we're gonna have so many decisions that have AI processing in the middle of them or one AI is uh, producing output that becomes input to others. And uh, at scale, I, could, I can easily see that an enterprise might need so much human oversight 
that you simply can't hire that many people. And we are you know, struggling to get people who can operate at that level, right? Entry level people probably can't second guess an, an outcome at that complexity level. Um, what we will do about this is not give up and go back to the way things were, were before. What we will do with this is get other competing AIs to help summarize that stuff down to a level that the number of humans we can actually hire, you know, the skills we can get, the people we can afford, uh, are then able to remove the bottleneck. Uh, and we'll just keep repeating that every time we 10x the complexity level. All right, thank you very much. Um, we are at time. We've received the red card, but really appreciate the conversation today and would uh, love to have a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you.